What, what, what are we all doing here? Is this Mezcal uh, Monday? Welcome back to Brett and Friends Mezcal Hour. Uh, we're, we're here for Mezcal 301 this week. I'm Pat from the Whiskey Hotline with Brett from the Whiskey Hotline. We have Monique and Lou and Michael back with us. Uh, we may have another guest at some point. We'll see how that goes. Um, but really, we're going to talk about kind of Mezcal adjacent agave spirits. Is that appropriate, I guess? Well, Is that a, a fair description or no? I, or does I think, it undersell what they actually are, Lou? Mezcal no, I, I would say I would say it's fair, but I think I think it's actually good at this point to start putting everything into a specific context, right? So, you know, each of us uses slightly different language when we talk about these spirits. And, uh, and Michael tends to like to say mezcal when he's talking about any of them. And I tend to say agave spirits. And I'm not sure what Monique says if she says anything. I don't know why she's muted herself. Maybe because she doesn't want to say anything. Maybe she's afraid that she'll make another insult uh, toward me. After, yeah, exactly that. Um, but, but, you know, I, I think it's important to recognize that, okay, when we say mezcal, Right, there is a DO that defines what mezcal is, and it's not mezcal. The agave spirit that we are talking about is not mezcal unless it's actually certified as mezcal. So if you go into a Binnie's, as I often am want to do, and you look at a bottle of, say, something like Cinco Centitos, Five Centitos, which is beautiful agave spirits, which somebody might say is mezcal. You can say it, but you can't legally say it, so it's not on the label. So what, what are people really looking for when they go into a store or a bar to drink something made in rural Mexico? That, I think, Lou, is sort of the context. I think it's very funny that you just translated Cinco, but not Centitos. Well, no, I, I actually, I didn't translate well, it's it. Like, it's like five cents. That's, uh, that's uh, 50 cents. Five cents is five cents. But, but the, the reason I did that, Monique, is because the label doesn't say Cinco's. And I always forget that it just says yeah, five. And so five that confuses people when they go looking for a label that says Cinco Centitos. There you go. Well, it's wow. And I, I sent him away. I scared him off. I think we're going to die because the bridge, and it's probably, it's interesting because I'm sure that Michael has to deal with different things than, I think that, Michael probably deals with a different level of education of customer just because there are going to be a large group of people who are who love mezcal who love all things agave all things Central and South American, they're going to go there which means they might have some background. There's a better chance that in Benny's it's somebody that might have seen this word someplace or heard of it that's really interested in exploring. So I think that there's two ways. I think that if somebody walks into a Benny's, it's easier for us to start with Mezcal because maybe now they're starting to understand that and then explain them to the difference, but still make that allowable that it's Mezcal. Michael, how would you, because it sounds like that's what you do, right? When people come to a stereo? All right, so, I mean, I, honestly, Brett, I think our, our customers are not that far apart. In fact, we're often the exact same people because right. I hear again and again at the studio when I turn somebody on to something cool, they're like, oh, wow, cool, can I get this at Vinny's? And I was like, I don't know, I will, I will send Brett a message right now and find out. Um, <laughs> so, the, Lou alluded to this, I mean, if we have faithful viewers who've watched every episode, Lou alluded to, to this, I don't know, two or three weeks ago. So like the, the old canard used to be, right? That um, um, all tequila is mezcal. Right. All tequila is mezcal, but not all mezcal is all tequila. Mm -hmm. So Lou likes to make a distinction, and, and I think it's important, and I don't you know, necessarily disagree with Lou. Actually, I, I'd, like to hear, I'd like to hear Lou make that distinction. But I think for, for the guests at home, before I talk more about what I'm going to say, um, maybe elucidate a little bit more on a DO and why some things are included and some things are not in Mezcal and that you're, you're using a legal Mexican definition. Oh, you're using that, that definition of Mezcal to make the distinction. And I think that's important. And I think the guests at home might not have that, but you're very passionate and you're very, I think, articulate on this topic. And so I'd like to maybe have you just run with the ball on that. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. Like DOs in general are supposed to protect culture. Well, I shouldn't say supposed to. One of the things that they can do in theory is protect cultural heritage. And, um, and, and that's an important thing. But I, I think the result oftentimes is 
the exact opposite of that. So if you look at the vast majority of mezcals, and again, when I use the word mezcal, I mean that certified mezcal, the vast majority of mezcals in the market, the brands of mezcal that come here are not owned by and large by the men and women who make the actual spirits. That in fact, the men and women who make the spirits either sell it to brands, work for brands, um, or they don't, and they can't use the word mezcal legally. And and that I and and then they have to actually to qualify as mezcal, they have to um, conform to certain norms of what mezcal is, even though that might not be the heritage of their family. So as a consequence, those families are cut off from this large market when in fact, I would contend that mm -hmm. it's the work of their families over the generations that have made what we think of as mezcal so appealing. And, and, and so it's sort of working at cross purposes. And I find the reason, the reason that I do not use the word mezcal for things like Cinco Sentidos, which are not allowed to certify as mezcal um, or not allowed to be called mezcal, is because I do not want to give credit to places like Zignum. And I, you know, I've, I think I've stated pretty clearly, even in one of these sessions, that I like Zignum. I like who they are. I don't like drinking the spirit. It doesn't appeal to my tastes, uh, but plenty of people do like it. But I don't think they should get the credit for the work that, uh, that Alberto does for Cinco Sentidos when he can't use the word mezcal. I think it literally undermines his ability to continue what he's doing. Hmm. Right. And, and so like L Lou and I definitely agree on the politics. Yes. DOs are all about protecting cultural heritage and tradition, right? Should be. You're looking at the French cheeses and you're talking about this wine or that one. They're, they're, they're protecting certain specific geographical tradition and cultural traditions, um, certain processes, right? And they're meant to do good. They're meant to, to make these process to keep these 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 historically and culturally important processes in place but in mexico unfortunately they've often had the opposite effect uh, so it's not just that there's only certain states that are in the deal uh for mezcal and certain states aren't which is bad enough uh and we're going to talk about maybe some south alisco spirits people who've been making beautiful, beautiful mezcal or agave spirits for three, 400 years and are not allowed by, by law in Mexico to call it mezcal. But it's also that you have to have your actual place of production certified, right? Getting your palenque, as they call it in Oaxaca, or like taverna in Jalisco, um, vinata in, in like Michoacán or Dorango, to be able to certify, you also have to pay money and not a little bit of money, a lot yeah. of money to get your actual production space certified. This disqualifies a lot of rural people, a lot of campesinos who make amazing spirits in our third and fourth generation from being able to release their stuff as mezcal. I'm sorry, Is that I'm where the brand this. participation comes in? As far as like paying for that certification, yeah. like Louis, say, what somebody alluded to earlier, oh, you know, exactly. we only see it because brands are essentially bringing it in, and not because of people are alluding to before. So that would be something that Pedro, but but Pedro, Pedro could give money. Pedro Jimenez could give money to his brands. David Ciro could give money to his brands Ooh, if he chose actually, to. Actually, no, because almost everything, <laughs> not everything, but the vast majority of what Pedro Jimenez releases under Misonte which is what I'm drinking right now. Can you which see? is just some of my favorite stuff. Absolutely, positive. Favorite place to drink in the world that is not my basement, sorry, Michael, is at the tasting room from Mazonte. Then, then comes a stereo. I would say Para de Sufrir, the dive bar he has down around the corner, and then Mazonte. But I'm with you. I'll yeah, take my right. I don't know. That, yeah, that dive bar is awesome. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, that's right, Brett. We had a good night there. Um, yeah. What, what do I say? Oh. Well, so the vast majority of the producers, where he puts a lot of his time and energy, are the producers of South Alisco, okay? Um, and we have three, we have, we, have se we have several possible DOs, right? They could be in a mezcal deal, right? Because In theory. They, 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 they take agave, they cook it underground, they ferment it, they distill it. <laughs> when they 
speak to each other, they call it mezcal, as in like, hey, Brett, would you like a mezcal? That's what they call it. But they're not legally called, allowed to call it mezcal. It's because not- they are geographically undesirable. They're just in the middle of nowhere, right? <laughs> South Alisco, near Nayarit, Michoacan. They can call it tequila because they don't use the red agave and they're about four and a half hours away from the nearest DO. And now there's a deal for a uh, Graicilla. And the Graicilla for a minute became sort of a catch-all for all of these spirits in Alisco. But historically and geographically, that's not correct. And the DO is actually doing it right. The area around Mascota in, uh, in Alisco and up in the, the Sierra Norte, and then the area just south of Puerto Vallarta, like Cabo Corrientes and Quito, that is going to be the deal for Graicilla. The guys in the south have been making it for 300 years who call it mezcal and do everything like mezcal. And unlike what they do up in tequila, where they have just one maguey that they grow and the second most of biodiverse state in all of Mexico, <laughs> these guys in the south are cultivating. So uh, agave, web, the agave, agave web tequiliana or agave azul, Uh, is a cousin of agave espadin. We've talked about these guys a lot. The scientific name for espadin is angustifolia. Uh, Agave azul is a cousin, something very similarly related. Kissing cousin, in fact. The guys in the South cultivate 10, 11, 14, 15 different kinds of angustifolia and one kind of a different kind called rodecanda. What they're doing is absolutely amazing. They are the most interesting producers in all of Alisco, and they're not allowed to call it mascal, raicillo, or tequila. But it does happen to be delicious. And Pedro Jimenez has done the amazing and incredible work of making these guys' work available to all of us. Sorry I talked so much. Now it's somebody else. I just also, there, I think it's so any interesting. Kind of, the idea is there any kind of, of an estimate or survey into how many of these producers are out there? There, there's some that even haven't even been discovered yet. I mean, there's some that are so okay. rural that it's like you're walking to the, you know, the Palenque or whatever it is. But it's also, it's so interesting to me that even as Pedro, it took him years to, you know, he might meet someone in a small town, buy a parcel of 80 liters of something absolutely stunning that, you know, maybe qualifies as Raicia, maybe it's something completely yeah. different. He then had to wait and develop that relationship for three or four or five years before he, they would take him to where it was produced. I mean, there are very, very, very small production facilities in many cases. But then the idea that you would go back to someone and essentially say that these folks at the top say what you've called it for generations or hundreds of years is not what it's right. called. It, it's just insane. Which is why it's interesting because we're kind of getting in a verbal, but this is, this is a good approach to the way so – if mezcal is a gateway word mm-hmm. to get people to understand artisanal, multi generational Mesoamerican spirits, if that is a gateway word to get them started, it's mm-hmm. not that there isn't a whole battle that needs to be had over the politization of politization, politization, whatever, they, of mezcal. <laughs> Right, I know that that word's not right, but everybody understands what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah. If there's there's no way around it, then then it sounds like that I'm kind of leaning with Michael in that. It's like, look, if that's the buzzword somebody is using that to to for us to get them started, to talk about the things that are coming from Mazante, to talk about other things, to talk about Satol, to talk about some of the other which aren't agave spirits, but are sort of lumped in with them, to talk about Bacanora, to talk about those things. If that's the start at least you know that people are interested in artisanal, multi-generational Mesoamerican spirits. I also, I'll say something probably a little bit controversial, but I also think the introduction of that term suddenly gives people a little bit different perspective on what they are willing to pay for an unaged spirit. Because Blanco tequila, I mean, now there's Cristalino tequila, which we know is aged, but then has the color stripped back out of it, which is freaking crazy, great marketing scheme. Um, but, but all of a sudden now you have people saying, okay, this is unaged, but I understand that the methods of production are, are so unique, that the batches are so small, that this agave takes so long to grow, that you have agave, unaged agave spirits that can command prices of a hundred plus dollars a bottle. And if it was like Blanco tequila, people are like, eh, I don't really know about that. So this is, you know, it's, there's a cool factor. There's a value factor to it. 
Well, sort. I mean, yes, but like all things, anytime we try to use shortcuts, um, we short sell ourselves or, or, or we can get sold short ourselves, if you will. And what I mean by that is, okay, so how much are you going to pay for that uh, Blanco Zignum? And, and I've heard enough of my friends who have brands of uncertified agave spirits express their frustration at going to bars, not obviously Michael's bar, but to bars that should know better, um, where they have trouble selling their spirits because people don't understand why isn't it, it isn't called Mezcal, and they don't feel like they can sell it if it's not called Mezcal. My, and, and, and my solution to that, and, and Lou's absolutely right, I mean, there's, there's a lot of this out there. And I just I, can I just linger that in that moment for a second? Oh, good linger. Lou is Lou absolutely right. right. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, it won't happen again. Um, <laughs> it, it might. It might. It probably won't. Uh, no, but my my solution to that is I um, I literally don't discuss it with the guest. I flat out treat what like cinco sentidos we talked about. Or Chacolo, which is a super cool brand uh, from South Jalisco, or Misonte, I don't make a big deal about whether it's agave spirits or not. I figure when I'm selling and they're tasting, we don't need to get into the deal. I just treat everything as mezcal. Um, that, that is an agave spirit. Right? And then we go from there. And I think once the guest has a certain amount of, of knowledge, both intellectually and uh, phenomenologically from tasting a certain number of things you know if they want to get into the politics of it obviously I'll be glad to speak at length about it um, but I don't make that distinction up front simply because I think it's a distraction and I want them to get into uh, the physicality of it I want them to taste the immense complexity and uh, sort of unfathomable richness of, of these spirits and these cultural traditions and then we can like deal with 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 classifying and all the things that, 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 that we Americans love to do. But we'll just be overwhelmed by the beauty of the spirit first. I was going to say, Brett, do you feel like, or Pat, do you feel like there's going to come a point in time when you're going to have to start um, more intensely classifying the way that things are on your shelves? Or is it going to kind of stay tequila, mezcal, catch-all? We've, yeah, I mean, I think we're already doing it because we've tried to go and it's like if we get the set, we kind of keep the brands that are right now the, the highest volume and the biggest sellers tend to share a lot of the same customers. So those are sort of grouped together. Then we'll get into more artisanal style of to your, what, what, what would be considered more artisanal style tequila in an ideal world. We might separate them Highland Lowland if we could, but yeah, just because it's easy to get them and the people that are interested in trying things are walking to the same place anyway. So yes, our section is going to have Mezcal, it's going to have Satol, it's going to have Bacanora, it's going to be adjacent to some of the flavored and indigenous Almondrado and some of the things that Grants is doing, like the, 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 the chili flavored tequilas. Tanteo probably abuts on that side because it's a flavored tequila. Um, Chirondas, we've actually tried to experiment. Yeah. Does Chirondas do better? Does Chironda do better if it is in with tequila and Mezcal? Or does Sharon to do better if it's in rum? And then once it goes in rum, because technically I guess that's what it is, you know, where do you put that? So we're playing God, around that's... with all of those. But the guidance is, I think you're right, is if all of them are lumped together, it gets people looking at the right, you know, eight feet by eight feet of shelf space. Then I think that'll you dive be an interesting a question ten years from now too, as we see more yeah. brands, you know, too. Because for for many, not every Binny's location is the Lincoln Park store, but just the huge, huge, massive shelf space and selection. So many Binny's might only have, you know, one uh, so tall on the shelf or something. Yeah, like we that. have to be and, more pointed a lot. You know, <laughs> but like with Lincoln Park, though, you know, we we could probably put more. This fly is just kicking Lou's ass. <laughs> It's so I funny. Know, I don't know what to do. It's driving me crazy. If you see me swatting my head, it's not because you guys are saying something making me nuts. There's a fly that will not leave me alone. I, ha <laughs> I think this might be the result of all of those cinnamon gummy bears I ate today that I mentioned before we started. 
Anyway, but you know, yeah. like what you're saying though, I find so interesting because I walk into Binnie's, the big Binnie's, um, I walk into the Binnie's and you've got like the aisle for the Italian wines and the French wines. And in essence, what you're saying, and I think it's really smart, is it almost needs to be an aisle for Mexican spirits. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Ah, do you I mean, put the wines there as well, the Mexican wines? Do you have any? You must. No, because, you know, so. interesting and not, we're kind of off a little bit of a small rabbit hole. We'll call it a, a rabbit, a rabbit puddle, not a rabbit hole. <laughs> but we're, uh, but uh, no, Mexican wines, actually, we found it is, they tend to do well if they have adjacency to South America. If we oh, put yeah, them yeah, yeah, adjacent yeah. to Chile and Argentina, that sort of Western hemisphere, Southern Western hemisphere, they do very well when they're there. Well, the so, thing oh, is with like Chiranda and Aguardiente is that a typical white rum fan, if you're a Bacardi white fan, you're not going to like Paranubes. It's going to be too flavorful and too massive and too over the top. And so I'm sure, Brett, you have the same thing sometimes with like Haitian Claron is like it's, it, you know, yeah. but somebody who's open to really lovely Mexican spirits, cultural heritage, generational production, things like that, you put that right there and go, oh, that rum looks really interesting. Yeah, ultimately, and you're right. And ultimately, you probably have to, you, you probably have to, if possible, put it in a couple places and see where it sticks. I, I think that's really interesting. I was thinking the same thing, Brett. I was like, I would, I'd be interested in an experiment. If you have charanda, like, right next to your mezcales from Michoacan, right? Right. Para is next to your guys from Oaxaca, um, and then also have it in rum, like, which will sell better. Because um, there's, there's so many... Um, people who live in Chicago descended from uh, folks in Michoacan mm -hmm. and with roots in Michoacan. Yeah. Um, and I find that the stereo that they they don't even know there's a, a really, really good charanda like you found available here. And they get so excited. I had a dude a couple of months ago who came in and we were doing a crazy pino colada that had like three different kinds of like oriente de caña from Mexico. It was all like rum from Mexico in it. Uh, and he tasted it and it was funny. He didn't read the menu and he was like saying to me, he's like, and we were speaking English, but he said in Espanol, he said, ¿Tiene el sabor de, de charanda? <laughs> uh, it's got the flavor of charanda. And I was like, well, it, cause it does, it has charanda in it. He's like, no way. And I showed him the bottle and I put it down and he's like, what? You guys have charanda? Oh, that's so beautiful. Oh, we have oh, charanda. Oh. Yeah, we got a couple. We to So I think I, I mentioned this in an earlier episode, but like I, before, for a long time, for years, my menu with Estéreo was by scientific name of the plant of the maguey, right? Because I wanted people to understand, okay, like Karwinski, for instance, is a, a very large Polish Catholic family of lots and lots and lots of magueys. Um, <laughs> And I wanted my staff to understand that, but I, 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 I changed it because we're talking about the guys in South Alisco, like the, the Partida family who makes like uh, lights, like Chocolo or, or the beautiful Mesut. Didn't I, didn't I buy you a light, Michael, so that you wouldn't have this problem? It's, the, it's goddamn right here, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it needs to be the other side of the computer, brother. Oh, That's okay. Yeah, you didn't okay. give me instructions. You just gave me the goddamn light. And you, did you get the pancake makeup? Just the... No. No, 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 all right, no. all right. Anyway, anyway. But, you know, but, uh, but so, so I, shit, I was in the middle of a point, Lou, but okay, go ahead. Um, oh, <laughs> oh, because I, the indigenous names for the agave to me are fascinating. Yeah. And South Luisco is a very, very special case because they have 12 different names for Angustifolia. Brocha, Azul, Del Cruz. I mean, they have all these beautiful romantic names. So the new menu, Estelio, which I'm still finishing, is all geographical. Okay. <laughs> So instead of separating, let's say, Sotol and agave spirits that come from Chihuahua, I just have everything from Chihuahua together. So this, is, this speaks directly to what Brett was saying. For Michoacan, I won't separate rum and maguey. It will be everything that comes from Michoacan. Mm -hmm. uh, That's and, beautiful. I was say, we probably need to add another session, maybe even next week, and start talking about non-agave spirits. I mean, not Sotol, but, but like Charanda, like Daniel just asked the question in the chat when we were going to do Toronto 101, but it's a whole nother <laughs> thing. Um, well, Francisco Terrazas that handles Paranubes, Cisco texted me last week and was like, whenever you guys want to do that, like, I'll come on. Cause there's a lot of other interesting things, but we got to stick with Mezcal 301 in here. So have we gone through all the different classifications, like what falls, well, as best we can, what yeah. falls into a Ricea, Bacanora? We did that. We, did, well, we did, we did the definitions of Mezcal last week. We did not talk about the difference between Bacanora 
right so, yeah. so, yeah, so I, let's I, talk I let's talk about how these kind yeah. of adjacent spirits what what a fan of a standard espadine mezcal would find similarly and different in any of these kind of spirits that they might have you know like maybe start with bacanora i guess so bacanora is only from sonora right and we only have a few producers available but it's made pretty similar to most mezcals correct well, it, it can be. Uh, certainly the, the legislation um, uh, surrounding it allows for the same processes. Um, and it, the, I, think, I think the way it's described in the DO, and if you go to sacred.mx, the, the website of my, my foundation, and you go all the way to the bottom, like the very last thing on the page, that first page, is this tiny little line that says, what is mezcal? And you click on that, uh, you'll get a, a spreadsheet that covers all of the regulations of each of the Mexican spirits and what, what defines it exactly. Um, but the weird wording is always a little bit weird in these things. So like with Bacanora, I believe what it says is it, um, it can be made from uh, ag um, uh, agave pacifico or any other agaves, or maybe it's like agave pacifico or five other agaves. It's, it's like, it's never really, they, they kind of suggest it should be this, but it could also be this. Mm -hmm. and, and Pacifico um, is an Augustifolio up north. So it's very, very similar. It is often very, very similar to an Espadine Mescal. Often, but Wait, not always. Right, dude, the light's so much better behind the computer. It I looks so good, Michael. Whoa, 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 that's twice in one episode, Michael. I think, I think I'm going to buy you Italian beefs next week. Oh, dude. He's also <laughs> just released five more flies to go for your skull, so. <laughs> but this is just one fly. Right, you know, but this is, I think we're, 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 we can connect some stuff here. So, so Bacanora, so scientific name, Angustifolia. Um, it, it's only found in Sonora. Um, and it's, it's, it's a Pacifica or Pacifica, it's Pacifica, yeah? I always forget. I think it's Pacifica. I'll pull up my spreadsheet so I can, instead of just making it's, stuff It's a lady up. agave, it's Pacifica. So... <laughs> In northern, in northern Chihuahua, um, when they're making what we would might call mezcal, which actually they don't call mezcal, and they're outside of the deal and they don't call it mezcal. Um, if you're working with that particular maguey, um, or actually making mezcal at all, they call it bacanorra. The maguey, the plant they will call bacanorra. If you're working with angustifolia. Um, so it actually and are those identical? And then is that Pacifica? Is that and I is that just a rename or is that a variant? Oh God! You know, the folio is only a botanist can answer that question. But like we're yeah. talking kissing cousins or like Jerry Lee Lewis style kissing cousins, like very close. Okay. Yeah, but it, okay. but it, actually, looking at the spreadsheet, it can only be made from Augustifolia. Yeah, okay. it can only be made from Augustifolia. No. So let's go down the line. So that was Bacanora. Let's talk about Ricea. Okay. Uh huh. I gave a thumbnail before. So because they have started a DO, mm -hmm. there is a definition of it. And like, I think the discussion of like Ricea in this country really was all pretty much initiated by uh, an amazing uh, dude named Esteban Morales. God bless him. And, yeah. Awesome dude. Uh, Branco La Beninosa, which probably a lot of people watching have seen before. They have like the snake mm -hmm. on the label and they have lots of different colors. Um, and he has told me that when he started the brand, he, he wasn't even sure that he wanted to call it a Grecia, um, because he does producers from all over Alisco in different spots. Um, but his project is incredible and his passion and care for the traditions of Mexican culture have made was the, really the first step in this country of making any of this available. And the only reason we're talking about Recilla is because of Esteban Morales. The way the DO defines it is actually accurate and I can't criticize it. It's the way that- I can. Stored. Okay. <laughs> um, geographically you'd criticize it? Yeah, 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 I'll criticize it geographically, sure. Okay, well, geographically, I said this really quick earlier, but there are, are, are like, honestly, sort of two main areas. Uh, one is a, a pueblo called Mascota, where Lou and I have actually been together. Um, 
about shit. What was oh, four or five hours? It was a oh my god, what the flag. Yeah. Anyway, it's about five hours west of Guadalajara, uh, and then up into the, the the Sierra Norte. There you have one tradition where they they like to use the word raicilla, and then all the way south of Puerto Vallarta, about an hour, um, you get a, a community called Cabo Corrientes. And in, in, in particular, a little pueblo called Tuito. And Tuito has always had like the most famous producers like Japo, who, who produces Miss Sonte is from uh, Tuito. Right. Um, that is your deal for Recia. And Nayarit. And Nayarit, and Nayarit. Um, and the two areas have very, very different traditions. In Mascota, you will see a different maguey, um, scientific name Agave Maximiliana. Mm -hmm. what everybody there just calls la lechuguilla, like little lettuce. They do single distillation, generally above ground ovens, stainless steel stills, to generalize. There are people who do some different stuff, but that's overwhelmingly what you see. In the west part of the DO, it's totally different. Two distillations, it's a hollowed out tree trunk, um, whether it's bornete or parrota, two different kinds of wood, two distillations, hollowed out tree trunk as the condenser. And there's two main agaves, angustofolia and scientific name rhodacantha. But what they will call unique to that area, which you don't hear these names, uh, well, you hear some echo of the, the rhodacantha is just called amarillo. And you hear echoes of that in South Jalisco, right? Well, they'll call it like ama, Isterro amarillo. But the angustofolia they call um, Chico Aguiar. And nowhere else in Mexico is angustofolia called Chico Aguiar, except like in Cabo Corrientes and, and Tuito. And to me, that's fascinating. Oh. So and communities have been isolated and they produce what they produce and you have your own name for it. You don't care what the guy 10 miles away or 100 miles away or 1,000 miles away calls it. Right, because they still work Love like it. It was 200 years ago and they didn't travel. Everybody, you, everybody you've ever met calls that plant Chico Aguiar. So there you go. Right. And, and all of that sounds, and all of that sounds really romantic and lovely and beautiful and wonderful. Uh, and it is, uh, but the way that the DO defines it, uh, it can be cooked in an autoclave, uh, doesn't have to be distilled once or twice. It's, it's again, you know, they, they don't go so far as Mescal, the DO for Mescal uh, goes to allow diffusers. Uh, so if you use a diffuser, you can't call it Ricea. Um, but here again, it's, I, I think it's one of these uh, things where it's going to cost the families mm -hmm. in order to certify as Ricea, and they're going to have to conform mm -hmm. to certain norms that they don't currently conform to. Um, and you're going to have all of these uh, uh, producers coming in and just literally who have no history of making it, um, who will use more industrial methods to make it. And it's going to be fine. Uh, I'm not suggesting that that means that it's bad, may not be to my palate, it'll work for somebody. But here again, you're going to end up with these families who can't use this word or I see it, although their, their ancestors were the ones who really, who really put the, uh, the meat to the bone for that word and made everybody interested in it. Yeah. No, and I'll tell you what, Lou is absolutely right. I'll say it again. Um, <laughs> it's a three-peat. I got a three-peat. You know, I call it drunk. It is, it is, uh, it is, it's really kind of sad for me that the, that, that the DO, and this DO is like honestly still getting started and it's already corrupting. Okay, they had like a lot of people pitched in and they got this budget from the government and then even when well, they, were it isn't it? they were organizing what? the DO and all of a sudden it was sort of gone. Let me just say one last thing and I'll shut up. Um, there you are. Esteban Morales, who launched this word in our consciousness and brought this into other cultures, into Europe and Japan, because he's all over. Um, he himself, he gave the DO a solid try. Like he's like, he was cynical. He was really tired of dealing, dealing with the CRM because he also has a mascara brand. He was really tired of certifying stuff and dealing with their bullshit. So he gave it a solid try. And then after a little bit, he said, you know what? when they pass all this stuff and it actually applies to export, I will call all of my producers who are in the DO for, for, uh, for the Raisilla. In the region. Call it de agave and we will forget about it. 
So he wants no part of the deal. Lou is not wrong. Right. Unfortunately, the DOs tend to corrupt. Well, but they do. But they're because it's it's the modern world. It's partially it's modern <laughs> world and modern commerce trying to define what is an artisanal, multi generational tradition. Oh, it's guys trying to make a lot of money by cashing in on cultural traditions who are writing into that DO when no real producer even uses one. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. But, but you know, I also, I want to put a fine it's point on this. Right. Yeah, but I want to put a fine point on this, Michael, because I, I know you and I have different views of this, though we overlap sometimes. Um, and, and I think we both tend to be frustrated by the denominations of origin. Um, but having said that, I don't want anybody to walk away from these sessions thinking that either Michael or myself dislike Mescal or dislike Raisia, because that's just not true. Right. Um, and but there are plenty of... Plenty of certified brands that we, we both love. Yeah, it's just the control, again, yeah. because the whole principle is if you, in, in a, in, in sort of a Pollyanna world, the whole concept of an AO, DO, whatever you want to say in Europe, is to protect a place. It's just like, this is the tradition of the place. We need to protect the place. Yeah. I think as it's being applied now, which is what Michael and Lou are hitting on, the fact that they, they're not protecting a place they're they're trying to regulate in such a way that if you want to throw some other things in there right then go ahead and do it because there might be some commercial viability if all of a sudden you roll a diffuser in and right. look if yeah. who's gonna, if you can't afford to even pay for the certification you certainly can't afford to pay for a diffuser yep yep well exactly. it's also it's like the, who is doing the survey of the place that you're trying to protect and right. it's really kind of the first person to get on that committee to start the DO that has the most money that's able to, okay, well, this is what we're doing. Oh, it turns out all of a sudden, those are the barriers. Those are exactly where that needs to fit. And I, I'm, I'm with you, you know, I, I, I think anymore, most people that just see uncertified agave or agave spirits, people are no longer turned off by it. And man, that's been a quick turnaround. You know, there was a point in time when people really wanted to see tequila, mezcal, okay, I understand what sotol is or whatever it is. Now, I think especially Mesonte, a lot of the stuff Pedro's putting out is people aren't really concerned. It still has the value. Boy, I, I, complete, I completely disagree with that, Monique. I think I think we live in a bubble in Chicago where people <laughs> have a better understanding. Well, I think you get outside of that bubble. You know, I've I've got good friends who work in the industry. Um, I've been reading their posts on Facebook, and you know, they've they've got their bars in I don't know, like Minneapolis or or down in Florida, uh, Delaware, and and they don't they don't get it. They don't get it, and this is still an uphill battle. And then, and then it's also, you know, they, they every we want everything to be easy, and we want to think, okay, so now if I see agave spirit, then I know this is the real stuff. But the truth is, there's also really commercial grade, and I'm not saying it's bad, but but not artisanally made, beautiful, handcrafted agave spirit. You can find you can find crap under any name, and you can find beauty under any name. So, are there any consistencies across I shouldn't the categories? Say crap. I didn't mean that. There's some yes. crap. Are there any Good consistencies? then across the categories like the use of artesanal or you know other words where right. somebody who's trying to get into the exploration of these things should be looking for okay this keyword actually does consistently mean something does that I mean, exist when, when we're talking about like who said mezcal adjacent i kind of like that so so mezcal adjacent uh things like like rejilla or all of the beautiful totally unregulated um, and they have no chance to be regulated. Spirits of South Alisco. Um, and we should say parenthetically, like two of the Beninosas, by the way, uh, which are called Raisia on the bottle right now, really historically aren't Raisia at all. <laughs> um, the orange and uh, the, uh, the red label, uh, the Sierra del Tigre and the, and the, and the Sur de Alisco, um, they actually work in clay pots which is totally unique in Alisco. And it's amazing that, that Esteban has uncovered these dudes. Um, no quattro culture is their link to, to clay distillation, which is kind of foreign to Alisco. But geographically, of course, they're barely in the state. So they're separate from the, 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 com the community of producers that, 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 that Pedro works with, which are about 30 minutes west of them. You know, all of these guys are doing things off the map. And so there literally are no words, right? And, and, and Mo, Mo already knows this. She's just asking the question. So somebody else will talk. 
but there are no words to 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 prove that it's good or bad. You either, you're going to have to do your research, or and the bottles are kind of expensive. Just take a chance. Um, ask somebody else, or go to a wonderful bar like Estadio in Logan Square and ask me um, what's reputable to buy. But they're off, they're they're off the grid, right? There's no criteria. You can't prove what's good or not good. Wait, are they at least labeled 100% agave? Can people at least look for that when looking for yeah. these? I mean, yeah. But the garbage is also no. labeled. Like no, only, I, only in tequila do they do they actually have mistos. Like yeah. everywhere else in Mexico, like it's like. Oh my God! In, in they fact, might do other abominations, but they don't do that. Yeah, so I'm gonna. I am gonna be in your bar. In fact, next week, Michael, tasting okay. spirits alongside you, one of which is made with. Agave and prickly pear. I don't know anything about this for Oh, and yet, and yet, I will be in your bar tasting it with you. Like, so my point is, like, even but that. Not, like, I'm sorry, real quick, I got to interrupt you. That's not a misto, okay? Like, I have a, a spirit right now from, from Resperal, one of the greatest mezcal projects out there. That's pilcuela, uh, a fruit from Oaxaca and Espadín together. But that's not a misto in the sense that we're talking about. We it's exactly right. misto. It's not 100% agave. Well, but here's the problem oh, and part oh, of the reason why we... Part of the reason... Part of the reason... I'm on your side, Michael. Part of the why reason why we... Two completely separate things. Right. Part of the reason why we started this was exactly, was exactly that, to get people thinking a little bit about everything, like what Monique said. Are there, what buzzwords can we give you that might potentially appear that will at least lead you down the path a little bit? And how can you in a more educated manner interpret a label, which is what Michael's talking about, because mm -hmm. what, you know, Lou, you're probably right. Technically, maybe those are mixtos, but that's not the mixto we're talking about. Which but there's no label that says fresh. there's no label that says mixto. Go, well, right, and there is no label that says fresh. yeah. There's not so a label in fact, that says mixto. There's just a label fact, that says tequila that doesn't say agave. That's right. And sometimes it doesn't say 100% agave because the company that's importing it doesn't want to spend all of that money shipping glass around the world. And so they're shipping in larger containers as a mixto, even though it's made of 100% agave. Like, so there's that? all of this confusion. No, no, stop. Who does that? Uh, 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 I'm sorry. Um, I should have this. Uh, Architecto. Architecto is doing this into the East for those exact reasons, because they're trying to make it a more sustainable process. And when so you're, that's, when actually, you're that's actually cool. It's the first people I've heard of. It. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Because I've not heard of anybody that wants to do that, because it was totally an economic function and not mm -hmm. an economic function to make the 100 percent agave more yeah. accessible, but an economic function to save money. It, oh, it, yeah. but it makes perfect sense. If you can ship yeah. like containers over here and then bottle it and save all that money, but it's really great tequila. Um, that's awesome. But again, this would be the one exception. Okay. So here's the other exception. No. About. So, and I don't know the name of this cause I'm not a tequila guy, but if, if we ask our friend Clayton, he will tell you there's an amazing mixto that just came on the market because they're using pioncio as the alternative uh, sugar source, and it's delicious. And, it, it's, and, and, and if anybody actually listens to the first episode of my podcast, Agave Road Trip, which helps gringo bartenders better understand agave, agave spirits in rural Mexico, if they listen to that first episode of the second season with David Soro, how did I do that? Was that good? Was I on that, Pat? If they listen to that with David Soro, they'll hear my suggestion that somebody should make a mixto where you're using 51% Blue Weber, 49% Sotal, which then allows us to now talk about Sotal. Well, they already have. There we go. In Chihuahua, they've been doing that for hundreds of years. And it's, and it's called tequila? No, of course it's not called tequila. Well, that's my point. Why is there not this, this, this tequila that is 49% Sotal, 51% Blue Weber, which allows us to now move into Sotal? All right, what so is, Sotol, what is it's what? another agave adjacent spirit. Uh, so it's not made from agave, though. Important distinction it's made from uh, the Dazzlerion Wheeliri plant, also known as the <laughs> Desert Spoon. Um, so, which I believe is more closely related to an onion versus an agave being more related to the asparagus, I think, right? Um, I don't know, but I'll probably lily. Really, I think agave, myself. I've always heard agave lily. Oh yeah, maybe it is Lily, but that might still be part of it. I don't know. We got to get a botanist on here. 
No, agave but, um, is but yeah, for but sure. that's a uh, that's a so tall the desert spoon, and they grow all over. I mean, we grow them in the southern United States. I mean, just like agaves too. Mm -hmm. um, but so tall is I think now made in three states. Is that correct? Durango, <laughs> Chihuahua. We got to consult lose all knowing spreadsheet. <laughs> Almighty spreadsheet. Sacred. We beseech thee. Chihuahua. Co oh my God, Coahuila, Huila, and Durango. Okay. Yeah. So Three see, states. I was right. We could have left it at that without Lou butchering the pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> and Coahuila was there's we don't have anything from there in the did I don't recall seeing anything from there in the states. Me either. There's, Michael, there's nothing, the third. There's nothing from Coahuila uh, exported right now. Uh, so yeah, Durango, Coahuila, and Chihuahua in the DO. But if you travel through Mexico, you will see it all over Puebla. You will see it in the Mixteca. Lou and I saw it together. Uh, mm -hmm. A mezcalero that Lou mentioned, uh, Armando Alvarez from Mixteca, <laughs> who's an amazing dude, who, who uh, Lou took me to his place. Uh, Armando actually went with me on a trip to Chihuahua last November <laughs> because he wanted to learn how to distill the plant. Because if you go to Mixteca and Oaxaca, they'll tell you, you can't make anything with that. It doesn't taste good. It has no sugar. Other parts of the Mixteca, they do. How would you describe but, the yes. taste of a so tall to a no, mezcal fan? To a mezcal fan, it has a lot less sugar than a magui. Okay, so drier. We should even back up a second, like until. Well, now here, actually, Evelyn is weighed in too, just while we're on this, and Evelyn, Evelyn well, is written in. Who works with who works with Marakame and Sikala? So a good friend of ours. Agave is a relative of the lily. Sotola is related to asparagus. So is agave technically, but genetically have distinct properties that separate them and qualify as different plants. There you go. Until the, until the mid 1990s, it was considered by many botanists to be uh, uh, an agave. So if it's if if it took that long to figure it out, yeah, it's pretty close. It, 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 it looks a lot like it, and it, 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 um, it has the same kind of quixote, the reproductive stalk, as the agave. But the thing that I find fascinating about the sotal, and I tend to not be, um, uh, I, I tend to not like the sotals as much as I like the agave spirits, um, which I think has something to do with the fact that it's not as sweet, Pat, to your point. Um, but the thing that I find fascinating about the sotal is it will actually reproduce multiple times in its, in its life, and you can let it go to seed and reproduce and then still harvest it and use it to make booze, it's whereas with the agave. It, well, is maybe that part of the reason it's low on sugar. I mean, when it creates that quixote, it's using all of its available energy. And that creates a lot of pretty bitter, waxy parts. I'm surprised you can do that over and over again, and we can still use that. Yeah. I say we, like I'm actually down there doing any work at all. We could get you up there. Up there. You are on the background picture. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I, I suspect that is one of the reasons that it's uh, it's so much lower in sugar by the time they harvest it. Though, you know, I, I don't understand this well enough to to speak to the particulars mm -hmm. of that. But um, but it must like blow out sugars, build them back up, blow out sugars, build them back up. And every time I do but this, I'm reproducing. Sugar. I don't know if everybody realizes that. Yeah, Desilia texanum and asparagaceae, and it is also grown in, and it's also there apparently is an artisanal product of some sort or moonshine produced in Central Texas. From those plants. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Texas so tall. We won't speak of Texas so tall today. That's a separate discussion. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. For sex, Texas so tall 101. All right. So we've talked about so tall. There's only a few brands available, at least that I know of at Binnie's. I don't, Ruble, you have, how many are at a stereo about? I carry uh, two brands of so tall because there's only two brands I think that are really um, doing oh. things right. Mm -hmm. There and there's there's three main areas uh, for Sotol uh, in Chihuahua. One is way 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 up north, uh, like northwest, way up there, which is a, a part of Chihuahua that's well, actually most of Chihuahua politically right now is pretty hot. Yeah, the, the cartel is kind of everywhere in Chihuahua, um, but way 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 up north is a brand called Por Siempre. Uh, which back our project, which is, is brings in Nuestra Soledad. Yes. And mm -hmm. Yep. Um, which I'm, I'm, pr I'm sure that you have the pinnings. Uh, we siempre. have had, Por Siempre, we have had a couple of the, I, there's nothing on the shelf right now, but we've had them before. 
Okay. From well, Jack Barton. Yeah. yeah. They only make the one. Um, they're way up north. Uh, it's a very distinctive area. I have not been because politically, like, mm -hmm. not a good idea to go. And, and the other brand um, to me, and uh, as revolutionary as Pedro Jimenez has been for Alisco, uh, and the understanding of all the beautiful heritage spirits of Alisco is Clande. Clande is the, the brainchild of a guy named Ricardo Pico, who is uh, born and raised in Chihuahua. He lives in Chihuahua City. And he, in, if you go to Chihuahua, he has like, it's kind of amazing. You go to, he has a bar uh, in Chihuahua City called El Magico, which is one of the great bars in the world. It is so much fun, as is Ricardo. Um, and he'll have like 10, 11 expressions uh, of it. He works with, uh, primarily works with like spot six producers uh, in Chihuahua. And the two main areas, so Chihuahua City is kind of like south and in the center of the, of the country. To the east is what they call El Desierto, the desert, um, which as my, you might guess is the desert and it's very, very dry. And uh, um, the spirits, the, the, the sotones from there tend to be like bone dry with just like a little bit of fruit. Some of my very, very favorite sotones. Um, and the other is in the mountains, when you go west in Chihuahua, uh, you go way up into the mountains, uh, which unfortunately, unfortunately is really, really thick cartel territory now. Um, but we went to up there to the city called Madera, which is where a ton of Sotol gets made. And there, the pine forests are so thick and rich, you can't believe it. It's like Michoacan, but like more trees. Um, and so literally the plants up there tend to have a little different flavor and you will taste that green, think like Karwinski in terms of maguey, you will taste some of that green and minerality and in, in the final I product. Say, even pine, I've had some of those where I thought blind that they were gin because they were influenced by totally, so many oh, of the conifers around Totally true. Unbelievable. <laughs> And can I just like, there's two other brands that I know are in Chicago and I'm guessing you've got a Binnie's that I want to talk about. Cause I, or at least mention, cause I really do love them. I know we're running out of time, but um, La Higuera and Flor del Desierto. Like when I, when I drink so tall, uh, my favorite stuff tends to actually, for, again, for my palate uh, tends to come from those two brands. Well, we definitely carry the Flor del de Desierto, the Desierto and the Sierra, which is kind of what Michael was talking about high yeah. and low. Yeah. Um, the Flor has one brand and, and from each of the two areas that I'm talking about. Yeah. Flora Desierto yeah. is great. They have one producer from way in the east, right in the desert, and they have another one from up in the, in the mountains. Yeah. So and then we have a couple, the La Higueras, La, La Higueras, it looks like we have the Leophilium right now. We okay. have the Cedrusanum and the Wheeler. Like um, neither of which are cur currently in stock. Like we do have like um, yeah. All three of those are produced. Um, Eduardo Rivera is a, the most famous producer in the desert area, and he makes all of the Laigueras. Mm -hmm. And he also makes the photo de desierto. The dude is busy. Yeah. So we've got we've got one of we've got one of the three currently. Yeah. Very busy. He also has the most popular brand in all of Chihuahua. Which we don't even, that's not even exported. And he loves to put snakes inside Sotol. He has a couple in his bar, which are really fucking creepy. <laughs> yeah, that is creepy. I've heard about that. I haven't seen one though. It's a Chihuahua thing for, for real. You must talk about sugar, and they just got a rattlesnake in there. In the, uh, in the mascot. The TTV does not love them. I think Flora Desierto, poor uh, Ismael tried for years to, to get it approved. I don't, I don't think it ever did. There's Chinese ask. wines that are fermented with snakes in, in the fermentation vessels as well. Really? Yeah, very popular. Yeah. Where? All over China, as far as I know. I've oh, read about China. them and seen oh, them online. Yeah, 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 China, China, not here, no. The land of a three penis wine. Yeah, they like a lot of strange animals in fermentation. <laughs> I think we need two more sessions. I feel like we need another session to talk like the where all of this is going and we'll work, you know, we'll get Pedro yes. Minas on maybe next week because- I think we um, need to talk about how to drink these and we need- God a bless. We, we, we gotta do that. Example I'm, from Ruble. 
I'm very three concerned six. too about um, you know, not three ingredient out of his... type of thing for lazy bums like me. Yeah, that's true. Wait, Mo, what not are lazy bums. I think that Wait, I'm there, concerned. Look, there's I'm, a rattlesnake. <laughs> I'm concerned about Lou not drinking out of his bowling ball. Hey, I'm, I'm actually in a different place. I am not in my basement at the moment. I do not have access to my oh, clay like here. Hey, hey, let's hey. make sure we covered all of our agave adjacencies, though. We talked about well, all so here. I was going to say, though, I, do think to... we need, I, I think we need two more sessions. I think we need a whole other session where we are even taking this farther and where is it going. But I also think we need another one on other Mexican spirits where we look at Aguardiente Charanda, whiskey that's coming from yeah, Mexico. Posh. Uh, all kinds of yeah. Posh, yep. Posh. Yeah. Posh. And back yeah. while we're on Agave, Agave, I'm just going to read something, a clip that Monique pulled up and gave, and it was a chat that she and I were having, but this is this is something that should actually be, because it is a correction to the correction, and, and I think we want to be accurate here so people understand. Agave was placed in the family Liliaceae, but phylogenetic analysis of DNA sequences later showed it did not belong there. In the APG2 system, agave was placed in the family agaveaceae. Agaveace. Wow. When this system was superseded by the APG3 system in 2009, the Aga agaveaceae were subsumed into the expanded family Aspar asparagaceae, and agave was treated as one of the 18 genera in the subfamily agavodiae. And so that's I just wanted to make him say all that stuff. Yes, and I, That's I think Agave one hundred and one, folks. Job. That's what we're doing. I think I, I think I did a serviceable job of you did an, all those you did things. An excellent job. I so, just, I, so I just well, wish I wish that, that I could watch the two botanists who are the equivalent of Michael and myself fighting over which of those words it actually well, if was. We're gonna if we're gonna do a deep dive and come up with one and make this a series. Well, who we need to get is Gary on. Oh, Gary. Oh, Gary, yes. Let's Naba. get Gary on. I'll reach out to Gary. Gary. Let's see if we can get It would have to be a right. four-hour episode. Before we plan more episodes, I want to make sure we covered every agave-adjacent spirit tonight, okay? <laughs> we talked Bacanora. We talked Sothal. Uh, we talked Ricea. We didn't yeah. talk about Lechuguia, but you're not going to see that on a label here. Lechuguia? Okay, so we don't need to talk about that right now. We didn't talk about Posh, I suppose. Which isn't um, agave, so that's okay. Okay, well, there you go. But um, neither is Satol, so, but I mean, Posh is probably worth, because we now have a Posh. Yep. Yeah, we have I mean, one. There, there is Posh. 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 Around. Oh, oh, Brett, um, you're so Posh. All right, so we got everything that's actually my... made from agave yeah, or its close relatives, right? Oh, no! Oh, no. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, my God, the name is just out of my head. When it's distilled pulque, it is... Oh, Tomiteca. somebody help me. It's Tomiteca. out of my Tomiteca. 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 Thank you. Only in now, certain regions. Otherwise, it's just distilled pulque. I've never had one of those, and I don't know. I don't think we have any at Binnie's. Do you, you have do. some of those at Estereo? I have, I have one. Okay. I recommend you go to Mexico and drink pulque instead. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go to your place and I'm drink gonna second it at Estereo. <laughs> oh, and you do, do you sell the cans or the bottles of pulque? Because like, that's not real pulque. But I you think, like, to, anybody who's me? missing... You talk, are you talking to me? No, I'm talking to Brett and Pat. I'm pointing to Brett and Pat. No, we had, we uh, had we a don't, supplier we, maybe 10 years ago, and we had a very limited amount, but it's yeah. been quite a while since... There, so what we've learned is that you can't... It's basically... It is impossible to take pulque, the state you that it should be drunk, and package it and get it here without having it turn gross. Yes, though, yes. In, interestingly, Agave Road Trip is going to be releasing some candy bars where what we did was we cooked the pulque down into caramel and then we stuffed it into each of the little squares of the chocolate bars. They're going to be delicious. You eat too many candy we, my, bars. My former company, enough. we used to import that pulque, Brett, that you're talking about. It came in these little plastic right. bottles that you would see yeah. people yes. in selling on the street. But essentially, it's... Um, I don't know. It's like getting a really, really fresh lager, which also, you know, like a fresh German lager, you know, or something like mm -hmm. that in the States, which is, is difficult to do because it's just alive and it's vibrant and they are so beautiful, fresh and just absolutely terrible a week later. Yeah. yeah. And they're interested. Now, what do you guys know? Cause it's, and we all know JP Garcia Buena. Um, the, he, there's a brand called Estancia, which I know that we have had some discussions about which are being called, they're agave spirits, and they're just being called a destilado de pulque. Oh, there you go. So that, as I said, it's not all comiteco. Yeah. yeah. 
So I didn't realize that's what Estancia was, but okay. And this in, in this state, this is, from, well. this is from, this is from, looks like La Chaca, Chacala, I'm sorry, Chacala, T-L-A-X. Yeah, it's, what, it's what Michael's been holding up. Yeah, Chacala. Okay. And that oh, is a oh. distillado, and that is all Salmiana. <laughs> yes. No, 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 different, different. Chacolo, Chacolo is different. No, no. Like Chacolo, yeah, like Chacolo, almost like the, the Basque pronunciation of the TX or the X. No, yeah, different. no, Chocolo is, Chocolo is different. Chocolate different. is different. different. Right, Chocolate. Right. Yeah. All right, well, I guess uh, people who We're have joined us, if you, want to, if you want to see us drone on about these other Mexican spirits, we're happy to do it. <laughs> Let us know. If you have any so questions, awesome. send them to spirits at binnies.com, and Brett will give you a long-winded answer, and I'll give you a shorter version. And, uh, <laughs> and in the meantime, yeah, that's what happens. And if, uh, and if you'd just wow. like to have a good agave drink, get your button to a stereo. And uh, I guess until next time. Next Sounds time. good. There's going to cool. be a next time. Yeah. There right. will be. We need to do Mezcal. I'm just looking here. There are some that are coming. Didn't we just okay. do Mezcal? I can't, but... What the fuck are we been doing so... for four weeks? Wow. Did I just become a ghost? <laughs> All right. Well, we'll be back, I guess, with more Mezcal. Hour. Oh, we got a question. See you next Monday. See you next Monday, Bob. We'll be back. <laughs> we'll be back. <laughs> we do have to taste Bye. some of those interesting Bye. Mexican whiskeys that are coming out because uh, yeah. they are worth tasting. Honestly. Anything yes. from Yvonne Saldana is worth tasting. So what are we covering Monday? What are we doing Monday? We're doing Sharonda and... Let's, <laughs> let's go Sharonda and maybe the corn whiskeys or something. I'm going to get Francisco to join us. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah, Francisco. So we'll, know. we'll get it up on the Binnie's website. And until then, we'll see everybody next week. All right? Oh, Thanks, all. Bye. Bye. Cheers. All right. Bye. Cheers, everyone. See you.